Lock us in, load us in, pop in that A track, spin the tape. Here we go. everyone, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Star Wars Time Show. But you know, since you're listening to it on a Wednesday, hopefully a Wednesday, which means you're a loyal fan, and you listen to the episodes right when they come out of the oven. But we're here to do this week's Resistance Recap. So we're going to be breaking down Season 1, Episode 19, which was titled Descent. Not the descent just Descent. And there was a reason for that, uh, because as Nick and I have been hypothesizing based on that mid-season sizzle reel trailer... We figured at some point in time the Colossus was going to be either sinking or taking off, and we learned that it can be submersible, so descent. It descended. But before we get into that recap and review, Nick, let's do what we always do about this time of the week, and that's break down the Easter eggs in Star Wars franchise references in the new episode of Star Wars Resistance. Again, titled Descent, 19th episode of the first season, if you're keeping score. So, Nick, as we talked offline, I mean, I, I cooked up four Easter eggs. They're, they're mostly, uh, they're all references, really. Uh, but it seems like in the second half of the this, this, this show, at least, the season, because of the pace of the episodes and how they're kind of hurrying the narrative along to the climax and really trying to get Kaz to where he is at now, right? They've kind of skipped around on slow bake type of narratives. Everything's super zippy, fast, no farting around, action oriented. So there's not a lot of time to look at backgrounds and random shit to find Easter eggs, but I'm still doing my best to get creative and tap into my star Wars knowledge banks which are getting smaller and smaller the older I get, but I can still dig in there and get some nuggets out. But as as we talked about, these four are, are pretty uh, uh, suspect. Is that the term we want to use? It's, it's a, a bit. bit Loosey-goosey, maybe? A stretch, you know. Some <laughs> of them, I, I will say, when I read the four that Matt came up with, I did notice there was one of them that I just straight missed just because I guess it was so commonplace to me that I didn't even realize that it was referencing something else in the series. And the other two, I was like, well, one of them, I was like, okay, yeah, I remember that. And then the last one, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, the, so again, like, but it's Matt legit. You, I, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll go to court over any of these and I'll oh, argue no. my points. <laughs> I look Matt's knowledge and ability. it's stupid knowledge. Like literally yeah. I'm pulling out audible knowledge like fucking star wars soundboard yeah, shit. this isn't even like questions you would get on jeopardy like what's the sound that a bongo <laughs> makes like no you know you won't get that yeah, yeah. well is... actually alex what is <laughs> but well with like an underwater muffling tone added to it yeah so i mean all right man let, let, go ahead what, what was number one uh, number, number one, one. I, I think it was not that loosey goosey, not that much of a stretch, but still is like, all right, whatever. No, man. this is a, I, I would call this a legit reference, you know, call back to another movie. So in the episode, we know from the end of the last episode, the beginning and the, the um, trailer for this episode that the resistance people on Colossus are, they're in trouble. They're surrounded by the first order. They need to escape somehow. And the way that they escape is thanks to Bucket gives them a smoke screen. Just like R2-D2 did in uh, Empire Strikes Back, Episode 5, when all of the Rebellion uh, gang are trying to leave Bespin, he throws up... And all, to me, I mean, like, if you really look at it, it almost looks like a fire extinguisher, like, fog kind of stuff that R2 oh, yeah. throws up there. But totally. everybody's able to get off. The, the vision is well, blocked. Well, you know, it's probably everything. Kenny Baker, like, with a fucking hosel hanging out on the side oh, yeah, of the just, like, scene, just squeezing it. it. Yeah, that's actually... I mean, you gotta remember, call. we forget sometimes, these, these the original Star Wars were shot basically in prehistoric times in terms of Hollywood technology. Yeah, no special effects there, people. There was no... You couldn't <laughs> no. build, like, an animatronic rig or anything like well, that. I guarantee was, there was no. someone off, off camera <laughs> either shooting it so it looked like it was coming out R2... Or they just said, hey, Kenny, 
take this hand extinguisher down there and jam it out and go ahead and just, uh, just squeeze spray. the trigger when yeah. you say go. Just spray. So, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty much the exact same moment for Bucket. The resistance gang is pinned down. They're about to be fully taken into custody by the First Order troopers, Commander Pyre included, and then up comes the smoke screen, which is the start of their, their escape moment. So it I mean, really- it, was an, it was an awesome start to the show. We'll, we'll get into that during the recap. But, yeah, I mean, Bucket, maybe he watched some, some hollow tape on one of the most famous astromechs in the galaxy, right? I mean, yeah. R2-D2's playbook for getting out of hairy situations. If anybody could uh, have told him, it would have been uh, it would have been Tora. Tora could have probably recounted the story with all of her memorabilia. I know from she back is she is definitely a an original trilogy super fan. There's no doubt about it, 100%. as evident by her her apartment room and all her Ewok collectibles and all that other fun stuff. All right, so next up we had a, another reference, pretty cryptic, pretty uh, unassuming, and honestly, most people. When you read this, you're probably like, what fucking show is this guy watching? Because I'm watching (laughs) Star Wars Resistance. This guy is making up a show in his head just to come up with Easter eggs. But uh, we met a new character. Uh, We were talking about her last week. We were dead nuts wrong on her, but that's kind of what we do. That's what speculation is. Uh, But Agent Tierney of the First Order, she's kind of like their uh, interrogator extraordinaire. Uh, but she's brought in to interrogate Tam because Tam is stupid and thinks the First Order is good. So she actually gives up, turns herself in because uh, she believes, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. And she hasn't done anything wrong. She's guilty by association with Team Fireball, namely Kaz and Yeager. Uh, but they arrest her. And when they arrest her, they put on something that my man Chewbacca is not a fan of wear- wearing, and those are binders. And Tierney herself actually mentions, like, hey, take her binders off, kind of playing the good cop role, right, Nick? Like, hey, take her binders off. She doesn't yeah. deserve those. You know. So I was like, hey, you know, they probably do hurt because I remember Chewie getting pretty fucking pissed at Luke when Luke tried to put him on to pull his con on the Death Star. Yeah, that was definitely one of those references that I did not pick up on immediately. Like, I probably should have, but as no, you should Like, norm- normal people do. would not pick up on that. Yeah. This is, but, this is, like, for non-normal people. That's a solid, that's a solid catch, though. I mean, like, that's a, that's a moment, like, a really big moment, relationship-building moment in episode four, when you see, like, Luke thinks that, oh, I'm comfortable enough with this Wookiee to put these binders on him, and then he finds out, like, holy shit, maybe not yet, maybe I'm not No, you're right, you're right. I mean, that's, so. that's a, a great little exchange by soon to be besties yeah but at this point in time you gotta remember i mean uh, han and chewy chewy have only known luke as long as it takes to go from tatooine to blown up alderaan yeah in hyperspace time that is going like maybe a few hours i don't know we don't really see how time works in any star wars movie yeah we have no no reference for that i think the only one where you actually no, it's one day going into the next is probably clones when Anakin has his dream. Yeah, when he's like right, wait, and, and, wakes and like up he's and sleeping with Padme, and then she goes out and sees him. So I mean, that's pretty close to okay. He went to bed and woke up the next day because of a dream. But outside of that, it's like I think I, I kind of brought it up during my insane rant on the uh, episode twenty one, which you people should go check out. It's live right now. Uh, but I brought up the fact that, you know, everyone wanted to jump on TLJ for the fact that Ray seemingly got trained by Luke in two hours, but everyone forgets that um, Yoda and Luke pretty much did the same thing on Bespin. So is that a, um, on Dagobah, Dagobah. is that a byproduct of how the Force works at these locations? Like it can honestly almost stop time? Who knows? But I, I, I've never really worried about it's that stuff. It's just such so. a, yeah, I mean, like, I, yeah, with, with, with that, it's just such an odd thing because, like, you are a force user. The force is flowing through your body. Does it just simply take somebody, like, unlock, essentially, like, unlocking it, awakening it, TFA reference, um, like, so, and just teaching you, like, okay, this is how you harness it? Because if it's that simple, then it could be, like, control. Well, I, I think the point everyone was making is, like, if you go to these force-loaded places... Yeah, maybe time doesn't function like it does outside of these places, it and that's why Luke went from being a whiny farm boy that just knew how to use a little bit of telekinesis through the Force uh, and swing a lightsaber a bit 
maybe his time with Yoda was actually months, but to us it seemed like day a day or two. Yeah, well, Just actually, like, if you think about, if you go back and, and look at one of the first episodes, I think it was of Rebels, when um, Ezra is getting his crystal, he's in that temple. Kanan's outside waiting for him the whole time. He's trying to find his crystal, and he's going through all of these trials, and when he comes out, he thinks he's been in there for days. Like He's like, how long have I been gone? Okay, yeah. And then Kanan's like, you've only been gone for like 20 minutes. Like You weren't gone for that long. And, I mean, Rebels has introduced time travel into the canon yeah so it's very possible that time distortion is a real thing when you're in a right. very powerful force area you know if, if where you are is super seeped with the force and we've seen that and like you said we probably saw it in tlj probably saw it in esb and we also probably saw it in rebels with that scene there so very interesting call out yeah, so what you were just treated there fans if you just listen to the resistance recap that is one of our patented star wars time show tangents yeah i don't even know where how we, we went from talking about binders to how to the theory of time in the star wars universe that was a that was a good one that was that's a good what you one. get when you subscribe so keep at it you're lucky all right. All right. So let, let's get back to real life, and that is our Easter egg and Star Wars franchise reference breakdown for Descent, number three. Uh, and this is, as I stated in the post, it's a cheeky callback. For those of you that aren't down with our brothers and sisters from the UK, cheeky means like silly, funny, you know, sarcastic. They, they did it on purpose to kind of like, ha ha ha, look at this guy. Uh, but really, throughout the second part of the season, Nick, the show is focused on this fuzzball, yellow-headed janitor <laughs> on the Colossus. Yeah. Uh, you used to see him in the background, kind of scrubbing the floors with a scrubber. Then the First Order shows up, give him a hard time, they take it. You see him again in the background, now he's scrubbing it. Kaz's like, hey man, if you had a floor scrubber, that would work a lot better. <laughs> Now, in this episode, they, they fully pay off on the struggles of the janitor when the Colossus starts to submerge underwater. He's still trying to scrub the floor, but now you have, like, gallons of water pouring in, and, and he just looks up like yeah. FML. He, he kind of, like, ML. throws his hands on top of his head, and he's like, oh, no. <laughs> like, uh, you got to feel bad for that guy. But that was, I mean, like, that is a... That's a callback within the series. I mean, usually we have the callbacks that Matt finds to other movies. We, we've other... had a few in this second half where we're starting to get eggs or callbacks or references to the series itself. This, to me, I, I brought it up because it was clear that the writers kept this gag in. I mean, oh yeah, he, he, you never hear the guy talk. He might flash on the screen for two seconds. But I've been following the ordeals of this janitor ever <laughs> since the first order stole his floor scrubber. Yeah. I mean, the guy, even before that, that I think life. like people would walk over like his shit. That he's cleaning. And he'd have to do it again. Yeah. I mean, he's kind of been like a running gag. So I mean, that's why I put it in there. Poor give, guy. Give him his, give him his nod. Well, at least now with the Colossus fully submerged, he doesn't have to worry about cleaning too much stuff. That poor bastard. I hope <laughs> we get one more shot of him. I know. Just one. I more. really want to say, I honestly, I want him to get revenge. And I want to like see him at the end, just like killing first order troopers with his floor scrubber. Yeah, I know, just something like he like throws out a bucket of water and just trips, like slips up an entire fucking cadre of exactly stormtroopers running down exactly the, <laughs> the hallway. Um, all right, so number four again. This is Matt's somehow just astute, perfect hearing that picked this up. I, I'm a self described audiophile. Though. Yes, like I, I've spent my life training myself and spending too much money to listen to stuff I like. Yeah. So this is a perfect example of that. And uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, this is the episode where the Colossus does essentially get scuttled. So that means we're going to have some underwater scenes happening here. And one of those underwater scenes, CB 23 Kaz's new droid that he picked up from Poe Dameron when he made the exchange for BB. I'm liking CB by the way. CB's fun, dude. CB. I don't know. I don't want to say it. She seems like a she. CB seems right? like a girl. I, th did, I remember we kind of talked about this. I can't yeah. remember if we decided on it, but I, I believe even 
maybe even during the first half of the season when we first met CB, I think Poe might have even refer to her as a she. Yeah. Well, the Star Wars Times boys are going to call her call her a female. Call her a, right. a I female. Right. I mean, boy. I'm shipping CB and BB. Oh, right yeah, now. dude. I think that's going to happen. This is the droid that will show up in episode <laughs> nine. No, but the droid love. Um, but CB, so CB's underwater. They're trying, they're swimming around. And essentially what, what Kaz is trying to do is, is shut down a communications relay. Now that the, the ship is, or the Colossus is scuttled. Cause he doesn't want any communications going out from the first order. So him and CB swim down. And, and while CB's underwater, the sounds, the jet sounds that she makes, are the same sounds that you can hear in Phantom Menace with the uh, the Gungan Bongo, the ship that um, Qui Gon Jinn, Obi Wan Kenobi, and uh, Jar Jar Binks were using to get through the planet core. So again, like th- there was, I could have watched that episode. What's his dumbass say when times. he's in there? Like, oh, oh, it's got a fish. Oh yeah, big gooba fish. Yeah, yeah, big, big Gooba fish. And then he's talking about getting he bomb he bombed her someone in the yeah. head gas or something. Yeah. <laughs> Love that guy. Oh man, Charlie's a fan of of him though. I really do like Jar Jar. Like I'm not, I, I don't really find them as offensive as a lot of other people do. I think when you have a kid, it changes your perspective because like you when, when you watch like you've seen TPM with with your kid, oh, and yeah. she's I mean, like, like into said, him. It, it's basically like how we used, and depending on how old you are, I mean, watching like like a, a practical comedian, you know, someone that takes pract- practical falls, that type, like Chris Farley. Yeah. And that's what Jar Jar is to little kids. I mean, he is a god, yeah. comedy god. But then once he wises up in uh, two and three, they hate him. That yeah. she could care less. She's like, "Oh my god, you asshole! You handed over the entire republic to a yeah. fucking Sith lord." No. Yeah. Pretty- now I think about it, I, I used to give Sheev a lot of credit. I mean, he kind of took the easy way out. Yeah, I mean, like he manipulated he the Jar dumbest Jar creature. In the, <laughs> I mean, in the galaxy. I could have taken over the galaxy. Yeah. If I knew Jar Jar. Yeah, I mean, look, he 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 had some masterful steps ahead of that, but if your final stroke is to convince a Gungan to give you right. power <laughs> it's not I mean, honestly padme should be to blame that she i mean was it did she charge. did was he an equal senator or did she leave him as her basically backup vote yeah that was it like she right. like the, the the gungans did not have like an official representative in the senate they were represented by padme because they were both from the planet of Naboo. right because i believe in the galactic senate you get a senator Per, per planet, per, per planet. Yeah. So she she was going off, and then yeah, she's like Representative Binks, you're you're you know yeah. taking my place or something like that. Like oh, there was an official. Like, people are trying to kill her and yada yada yada. Yeah, there was an official handoff essentially, but yeah. Anyway, uh, another... Sheev, you're still my man, but man, that was weak. That was yeah. weak sauce going going after Jar Jar to yeah. get the deed I mean, done come... for your supreme powers. Come on. Yeah, that was that was really low hanging fruit there, but. Those that could, uh, you know, finishes off our references and Easter eggs for this for this week. Again, not a ton, but this was an action packed episode. So we'll move into our recap and review. And again, Matt, like you said, these episodes post, you know, mid season break have been really fast paced and really moving cast toward that ultimate end goal of having him and the resistance gang there while the the first order takeover of the galaxy is essentially happening and we're we're well on the way now with this episode. Oh, I mean this the this episode's the first one that was a true continuation of the last. I mean it literally picked up at the exact end of episode 18. So as Nick said, th- I mean the pace is full throttle from here on out. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's it's been hard to kind of dig up easter eggs and I don't even know if it's been hard. I just I don't think that they've been the, the writers, animators have tried to cram them in now that they're just trying to tell story at this point. So, I mean, it opens up Team Fireball. They're under arrest. Uh, we find out why they're under arrest. It's because the First Order knows that the Fireball itself was in that sector when Kaz and Poe were out there. Uh, you know, it was getting shot up by Von Reg, this, that, and the other thing. So that's why they're in trouble. We didn't really know why at the end of the last episode. We, so we know that. But without flinching, our boy Bucket 
provides cover so Yeager, Kaz, and Niku and Tam can get away. But lo and behold, Tam gets split up. She's stupid. She doesn't know what's going on. She loves the First Order. So uh, Yeager, Kaz, and Niku get away with the help of Bucket. And my God, Nick, how about that? What Bucket did. Dude, it was a like. Not only did he moment. do the smoke screen, but what did he? What actually happened? Yeah, I mean, he get he takes a shot. He takes a, a blaster bolt right to the to his skeletal frame, and then he he falls over. He falls over the Colossus. And yeah, I mean, is, and Yeager's like, no. I mean, yeah, it was a emotional a, moment, right? For a droid, which is fantastic, and it's a cartoon on top of that. And I really was is like, damn. They're getting heavy right off the bat. Like they're actually they're jamming in some emotional weight right off the bat. Now we learn later on that Bucket may not be gone, but uh, it was a great opening, action packed. Really set the stage for the tone of this episode, which was all right. It's time for everyone to lay their cards out on the table. It's time for everyone to start letting everyone else know what the fuck's going on. So Kaz and them they get away. They're on the run. First Order now knows who the Resistance spies are. Uh, they basically consider Yeager to be one, Kaz to be one. Anyone that's associated with Kaz and Yeager is essentially Resistance spy. Really, Team Fireball is a spy, so they're on the run. Tam, like I said, she gives herself up. She thinks if she cooperates, the First Order is going to be all cheery and lovely, like her head tells her they are. So she's caught. Kaz clearly was distraught by the fact that she got left behind, right? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, the whole episode, he's like, we got to go back. We got, I mean, Jaeger's like, fuckhead. He's like, we got to go. Yeah, we can't go We're going to get caught too. They were, I mean, they were firing live ammunition. This, these weren't stun bolts that they were shooting out. This was live fire that they were shooting at the entirety of Team Fireball. And, and Kaz, Jaeger, and Niku made it out by the skin of their teeth. And, and Tam, you know, for lack of a better word, froze, but it was more more than likely due to just her naivety. Like she well, is still and under. She, to, to be fair to Tam, right? She doesn't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, exactly. I like mean, even Kaz, when she's like, "Kaz, they're li- they're they're full of shit, right? Right?" And he's like, "Um, uh, yeah, it's complicated." <laughs> yeah, like she, you know, he lays it out. Like you know, the first order lays it out. Like this, he is a spy. He's working with Poe Dameron, who is a known resistance operative. And she freaks out like this is like her world is crashing down around her. Well, yeah, we, we get to that point. But before we get to the point, we, we have to meet somebody. And that is Agent, Agent Tierney, who, you know, Pyre brings in to question Tam to get to the, the heart of things because they think Tam's in on it, too. They don't know that she has no idea. Yeah. But, you know, Tierney comes in and kind of starts playing the uh, good cop on her. And and it and it's working. And as Nick said, that they eventually they they make it to the Aces Lounge, which is completely empty now. And I don't know if you notice when they walk in, Tam's kind of taken aback by that. It's almost like she realizes like something really is kind of fucked up. But she's still going along with it. And that's when Tierney's finally like, "Listen, who do you think Kaz is?" Yep. Oh, he's some poor kid from Coruscant who wants to be a pilot. Oh, really? He's actually super rich. From Hosnian Prime, and he uh, was part of the New Republic Navy. Here you go. Yeah. So you can already tell the First Order is they're working Tam. Yeah. I honestly think at this point, Tam's either going to join them and and be a an antagonist in season two for Team Fireball, or something's she's going to see something shady, or maybe she sees them kill Yeager. And then she's going to figure it out and rejoin Team Fireball. That That's my new prediction. That's what I'm going with here. See, I think that, that she's already, like you mentioned, you know, she gets into the Aces, uh, like, hangar, and that's, like, her first sign that something is, is up here. And I think, like, her naivety is slowly starting to break a little bit. Like, it's starting to pull back, and she's starting to realize, like, something is not right here right but she also knows that her friends are lying to her too yeah and it's just gonna so that's come what down. i mean like i really think tierney here knows what's going on and she's trying to to essentially, almost build tam up as an asset yeah like to, to get her to switch sides yeah it's definitely like, look, possible. they lied to you they're they're scumbags remember hey the first order we we're just here to cr- to provide peace through absolute order 
Yeah, that's what she says through too, through absolute order. Like that is like, hey, Tam, you get it. You know, you might have to knock some heads for for peace, but that's how we do it. You like the Empire, right? They did the same shit. Yeah, and you know, her grandfather, like we found out, worked for the Empire, and he was, and she looks at him as you know, he was just a man doing a job that he needed to to support his family, and so so they know. I think Tierney knows. They they didn't just bring this character in for fun. She's going to be doing something. She has some plan or plot going on uh but anyways while while tam's being interrogated by tierney that's really tam's main thread this entire time kaz yeager niku hit a dead end right they're fucked yeah but who comes saves the day the shell folk the turtle people <laughs> vis-a-vis kel and isla kel and isla have been just the, like you said before, like there's a lot more to these kids than we think. Again, we haven't gotten anything confirming that they're force users, but they came in in a pinch. They needed a place to go. Like they had nowhere to go. They were lost in the station. And then Kel and Isla showed up and, and gave them a, at least a place to hide for the time being while they tried to put together a plan. Essentially, they were trying to figure out like, how, how do we get something out to the resistance? Like we have to let them know that what's going on right. here. And they're at they're at DEFCON one yeah. at this point. Like they're fucked. They they've been, their covers blown. The first order is fully taken over the Colossus. It's bad, and they need to let the resistance know. I mean, I think Kaz believes that they're going to come help him, but as we learn at the end, and as we know as fans, that was never going to be a possibility. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they they need to break the comms blackout. So uh, they're down in Turtle People Land. And who they find down there, Nick? Bucket. Uh, oh, yes. The shell buckets. people caught Bucket him in their fishing back. nets, repaired them. So Yeager had a great little reunion. That was a, an awesome little emotional moment Our, between man and droid. <laughs> it was uh, just so cute because they're like he comes back and he's fine. Like he doesn't even look like he's like ragged or anything. Like you see him take a, a bolt. You see him take well, a ragged. Shot. I mean, the motherfucker is ragged. In all the time. state, he yeah. doesn't even have a, a shell. On and I his guess body. you see him like they did put him back together because you see him and he gets his helmet put back on. And so they, right. they were probably doing some work on him. I love Bucket. I mean, he yeah. literally is a frame. Like, yeah. He has no head. It's just a fucking pilot, it's just a helmet pilot helmet. Yeah. And that they, they just stick on. And then his his astromech body, unlike R2, doesn't have coverings. Yeah. It's so just, the, it's just a frame. So the turtle people essentially fished him out in their nets. They're like, oh yeah, like he fell right into our fishing nets. And we yeah, like, so, so that was great. Oh, so yeah. they're all down in turtle people land, which is essentially engineering. No one goes down there. They let, they let the, the turtles do their thing. And that's where Kaz, in kind of his, uh, his brand of thinking, really started to shine because he's the one that deduced the plan yep. to sink the Colossus, which in turn would bring the comm blocker within reach. You know, instead of trying to scale the Colossus and being out in the open and definitely getting caught, he deduced like, hey, if we sink it, we only get- Doza's tower will be sticking out of the water. We can swim out under, get right on, and shut it down. And, and Yeager's like, basically he said, Kaz... That plan is so dumb, it's brilliant. Like, yeah. it, it's going to work. And he's like, only you could come up with something like this. So <laughs> Nick and I have been talking all along. Kaz, we've seen him make these baby steps, this entire return, the second half of the season, baby steps, becoming that Star Wars hero. By the end of this episode, he's done that. Yeah, he's. But th- he's this was just another guy. step where he actually formulated a great plan the older guy, his mentor, is like, holy shit, that is fantastic. Uh, Doza bought into it. You know, they send CB to go get permission from Doza. Like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Are you cool? Are you going to get the hatches closed? He's like, fuck it, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, so I like how Doza's kind of been brought into the good guy mix. That That's fun. Tora's in there. She's always yeah, fun. And he's, Doza's running interference for them, too. I oh, mean, yeah. Doza's full on in the, resi- like... Uh, I guess Kaz is technically the only true resistance member at this point. You know, Yeager has self-stated, I'm not in the resistance, but he clearly fights for their cause Yeah. at this point. Uh, same with Doza. I mean, he left the Empire for a reason, so you probably think that he's got a good head on his shoulders, and he knows when the situation's fucked, 
and he's reached that point, and he knows where the good guys are, and he has aligned himself with the good guys. Yeah, so, I mean, essentially, Cass puts his plan into motion. CB uh, and him swim down to turn off this this comms relay or to disable the comms relay that the uh, first order is using for interference. And the whole time Doza is in there with Pyre saying like, Hey, look, you know, we're having comms problems. Like he's running interference. He isn't like resisting or anything like that. He's pretending like, Oh, he's great. He doesn't know what's going on. And (laughs) it was awesome. Yeah. So it was, it was a fantastic plan by Kaz. And what I love about it is that throughout this whole episode, he didn't accidentally do anything that that just turned out to be good like everything that he did was like you said it was planned he executed it and it worked out exactly well not maybe not exactly but you know it worked out the way that he wanted it to he didn't he didn't stumble his way into a victory this time like he actually executed a full straightforward plan and had oh, it working totally his and i think i even wrote it up when i said like hey kaz the hero's here but i i still hope we get some of that that clumsy happy-go-lucky, innocent Kaz hero antics moving forward. Yeah. Uh, but by the end, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about We're almost there. But, I mean, he is – he's full-on up there now with with the Poes, the Lukes, the Hans, the Finns. Uh, I mean, he he's had his growth, you can tell. He's ready to take responsibility, take a lead role in this fight, the good fight, the resistance fight. So, yeah. Love the guy. Love Kaz. And that's not just because Mr. Christopher Sean is gracious enough to stop by the Star Wars Time show on Instagram and now on Twitter and leave comments, follow. If you don't know who that is, that's Mr. Kazuda himself. Much appreciated. Love Big Chris. I don't know if he goes by Chris Christopher. If he's someone like me, my real name's Matthew. I hate that name. (laughs) Only my mother calls me that. My name's Matt. But, you know, some guys like their full name. Either way... Christopher Sean we is a okay. Yeah, we appreciate with Team the Star love. Wars Time Show. Love the guy. Um, I mean, if you want to talk about fan service, here's an actor that knows how to get in, have someone with the fans, make their day, and all it takes is a simple like or comment. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what we look forward to. Like, I got a I got a notification on my phone today while I was at work, and it was from Star Wars Time Show Twitter, and I was like. Oh God, Christopher Sean followed us. Wow, that's I was like, holy shit, that's pretty awesome, man. I mean, yeah. yeah. So I mean, stuff like that's so, amazing. So hashtag Star Wars Resistance, and you're you're gonna get that man's attention. He's a good guy. Yeah. All uh, right. So Nick, we, we we've we've led him up. The plan's been enacted. Yeager, Kaz, CB, they swim out. They get up. They find the 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 comms relay. Yeager does his thing, gets it shut down. Mission accomplished, right? They they get the signal out to the resistance, and immediately they get one back. But because Tierney and Pyre, they're no dummies. They weren't born yesterday. They're up there in Doza's office, and, and they, they know something fishy's going on. I mean, yeah. Tierney, she even says, like, eh, I find it kind of weird that this is happening today as we just outed a resistance spy yeah. cell. And as soon as the the comms block goes down, you know, Doza's like, oh, it must be wet. And then Tierney looks at it and she's <laughs> like, it's not even submerged. So yeah. something's definitely up here. Um, right, and, so yeah. Pyre runs out with it with a little squad, and a little, we get a little shootout. Yeah, we get a shootout that, you know, it's almost like the shootout that we saw in episode four where you have, you know, the the good guys kind of ducking behind something and shooting back at the bad guys because Kaz and Yeager and CB are behind this console that they use to turn off the the uh, relay and then the, the tro- troopers are in the door. But all this is going down. All the, the blaster bolts are going off. Kaz actually gets nicked in the arm by a bolt. Not too bad. He shakes it off. Yeah, he took a Leia. It's yeah. like the, the, the Leia hit in Jedi. And, yeah, in Return of the Jedi. It's like, I'm fine. Go ahead. And then, um, But then Yeager realizing that if this continues to go on, that there's no way you know, the three of them can hold off the First Order for very long. He makes the sacrifice. He makes the noble sacrifice. Loved it. He throws Kaz and CB into back into the water to escape and gives himself up to the first order to make sure that the cause lives on. Like you said, you know, he, like you said, Matt, you know, Yeager has always said he's not a member of the resistance. Like he's just, he's helping the cause by helping Kaz, but he doesn't consider himself an actual resistance member. 
Um, this at this sacrifice. point, I wonder what he would say if asked that question, though, because I, I feel like lately, at least second half, the way him and Kaz have been meeting, plotting, talking, scheming, I, I feel like he pretty much is. Yeah, and you know, I I, I was giving Yeager some shit. I honestly thought he was going to be this big, little twisty thing, you know, really shock us like a, a legit Star Wars twist. I don't know if we've really ever had one. Outside of the I'm your daddy, but at this point that moment's so old and it's so out there that even if you haven't seen it, it, you know what. Yeah, it but is. I mean, dude, at this point, how it's it, I think it'd be nearly impossible for someone, at least a, an adult that has a brain, to not know who Luke Skywalker's dad is. Oh yeah, I mean, now I mean, what, my my fucking two year old knew it going in, and that's just from books and seeing stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when when that first dropped in theaters i can remember like i well i wasn't there but like i remember reading you know people lost their minds but yeah it's, oh yeah it's such a part of pop culture and not even pop culture just american culture now that like everybody knows everybody knows that Th- that's Skywalker's what i mean just in star wars isn't really it's not a big mystery twisty type of show but it'd be nice i mean i i think we're in store for a bit of a twist in nine i really do i mean I just don't see it being First Order versus Resistance. Wham, bam, thank you, man. Miller time, good guys win. I, I Something's going to happen. Yeah. So moving on, getting towards the end of this episode, like, like you said, Matt, they get out a, a signal to the Resistance. They say the, the, the Colossus is completely under attack. We're, we're under complete First Order occupation. We need help. So we assume that like this is going to go out to the resistance and maybe they could help, maybe they don't. But an unexpected crew picks this up, and those that's Kragen's crew, the pirates that were. I love this. Yeah, and this is it's all paying off on my prediction with Sonara. Yeah, I mean this was a perfect, perfect move by the writers of the show because we know that the pirates have been wronged by the First Order. They were used yep. as patsies uh, to show that the First Order was there to protect Doza and his family when. They set up the pirates to, you know, to make it look like they were kidnapping Tora. But now the pirates are still out there. They get this message from the resistance. They intercept this message from the resistance saying the First Order has completely taken over the Colossus and we need help. And you can see Sonara hears this message. Kragen's, you know, listening to it. And they don't right out say like, okay, we're going to go help them. But, you know, you can tell that's probably on their mind. So here's, get that. here's what I'm thinking, Nick. I, I don't know what you thought. I, I don't know if it's going to be the pirates as a whole want to go help. It's either going to be Sonara convinces them or she sneaks off on her own. Yeah, I think at this but point. But she, she's going to be the key to getting the help in. Because, I mean, what, what in the end, what was a fucking pirate care? Yeah, I mean, Kragen at about the very helping most. helping people. You know, Kragen at the very most had his ego bruised. Right, he might move. want a little revenge, but he's he's probably not an idiot to know that his little beat up ship is not going to take on probably even a garrison of first order troopers. Exactly. Or or, or like a, a squadron of ties. Yeah. It's not even close. I mean, like we said, when, when the ship was first revealed, like it looks really cool, but it's essentially just the mishmash of broken tie parts and everything else that they could find. I mean, they're, they're, they're more scavengers than pirates. Yeah. So, Uh, but I, I do think now, I think it's pretty clear that the pirates or at least Sonara are going to be Kaz and company's ticket off the Colossus. I think you're a hundred percent right there. And I'm still going back to my initial prediction that she's either going to sacrifice herself for Kaz and company or rescue them and end up joining them. Yeah. Going into season two and knowing that it's a cartoon, even though it airs at fucking 10 (laughs) o'clock at night, that is, people. I don't think they're going to, like, waste Sonara, uh, but I would like it. I mean, you know, I'm kind of angling for these slightly more adult themes. I don't think we're ever going to get them. But but I've been saying this day one with Sonara. She will redeem herself and help out Kaz and company, and and now it's, it's pretty much set in stone yeah i think so that was a perfect setup at the end of the episode and i mean we knew that that character was going to have some sort of significance outside of just her initial you know pirate art i mean she got an action figure for christ's sake if you get an action figure you're, you're usually more than just a yeah. nobody you're sticking around outside of what's his name captain zuvio or constable zuvio from the force awakens who got cut 
but actually got a figure. <laughs> Typically, you got to be somewhat of a character to get a figure. Yeah, to get something. So, the so yeah, so the pirates get it, but Kaz also, I mean, he returns to the group. They're still hiding with the turtle people, and, you know, he plays the message from the Resistance. It's from General Leia herself, and she pretty much says, like, hey, Kaz, we love you, buddy. Thank you. You're definitely a Resistance team player. But uh, go fuck yourself. You're not getting any help. And my advice is to try <laughs> try your best to stay alive. And if you do, here's our next base. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Basically, we can't help you. Like, we yeah, appreciate... Th- thanks for your service, but you're fucked. Yeah, we, we appreciate everything you've done for us, but there is nobody coming. We, ha- we don't have enough ships. We cannot support you. You're done. But if you live, you can come find us here. But by the time you get there, you'll realize that we're all been wiped out anyways. And there's about 30 of us left. Yeah. So it's very And I'm dying too because I died in real life. Yeah. So at this moment, there's two paths for Kaz. He could, he could be in complete and utter despair. He's not going to get help from the, from the resistance. But he takes the other path. He takes the hero path. And he says, you know what? We are the resistance now. We are the resistance. We're here on the Colossus. We are making sure that this station is not going to be under first order control. And and that is a perfect way to end this episode because this is what we've been looking for the whole time is for Kaz to come in and be oh, yeah. that hero. Yeah, I am the guy. Yeah, perfect setup. So. Follow me. I will show you how we're going to get this done. It, it reminded me very much... Of Luke when he made it to the Masasi Temple on Yavin and he was finally with the rebels. Yeah. I mean, and you could see that he was like finally embracing, like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm a rebel. I'm gonna help these guys, especially when he goes to talk to Han, like, hey man, where are you going? You're leaving? What's up, man? What? That's fucked up. I mean, you could tell like Luke was, he was ready to lead, be a hero. You know, he was, he was over being little, oh, Oh, I'm farm boy Luke. Uh, they, uh, they make me work on the farm all the time and fix evaporators. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the days of him saying that he can't go anywhere because he has to uh, help right. with the harvest, they're over. He, he got there and he was ready to rock. Where Kaz, on the other hand, he's always been ready to rock. He just wasn't quite ready mentally to be that hero. Yeah, he needed to go through the experiences that he's been through in this season to get to that point because now there's nobody. Poe's not coming back. Yeager is captured. There's nobody left to lead this charge, to lead the resistance on the Colossus other than him. He's the only one. Right. Aunt Z's it's gone. It's going to be him, Doza, Tora, Niku. The aces are bucket. probably going to be in there, the remaining aces, I would imagine. But, I mean, we only saw one. We only saw... Right, the... What's her name? Four uh, men, I think. The, the Russian... Yeah, the Russian She lady. just reminds me of, like, a, a Russian cadet. Yeah. Um, so she's probably on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> so... Right, then she just reminds me of, like, a female Russian swimmer. She's that like... Has uh, taken, like, testosterone. She's like... What you call it? Sylvester Stallone's ex-wife. What You remember yeah, that, like, that lady? Helga. <laughs> I know exactly who you're talking about. Uh, Bridget don't. Nielsen. That's her. Yeah. Bridget Nielsen. Yeah. yeah. Just, just Jack. Exactly. Yeah. Like an, like an Amazon woman. Yeah. So it's probably, you're right. It's going to be, it's going to be, you know, Kaz, Tora, the rest of the aces, Niku, CB, and Bucket. <laughs> like, that's it, dude. Kel and I. You know who we haven't seen in a while? Uh, Flicks. Flicks and Orca, maybe they'll, oh, yeah, maybe they they'll could, get in on the uh, escape here. That's true. They could do something, too. I mean, they got a bunch of gadgets back in the, uh, in, what was it called? It was Requisitions, requisitions. or whatever their shop yes, is. Yeah, I mean, basically, they, they run the store there. So yeah. that was good. I mean, it was a good episode. Uh, it's it's funneled us right into the two-part finale. Nick and I still haven't figured out if it's going to be a one-two punch, like an extended episode, or if it's going to be still broken out over the next two weeks. We should know for sure tomorrow. That's when Disney sends us the episode preview and imagery. Uh, So make sure to stay tuned to StarWarsTime.net. I mean, we do other things besides talk like idiots on microphones. I mean, we do do some videos. We try to get out news posts. And, of course, we're always doing our Star Wars artist features. So if you're on Instagram or you make Star Wars art, let us know. Yeah. I like to share it. That's what we're here for. I mean, it's all about being fans, celebrating what we love, and trying to have a good time. You know, sometimes 
even me, I'll get a little trolly about the prequels. I'm trying to get better at that. Uh, episode 21, I definitely went off the rails. So I apologize saying to you that I offended. I mean, I, I still stick to my opinions. But uh, uh, Nick and I, we're going to try to pull back from that, that dog and pony. We, we've done it enough. You get it. I'm not a fan of the prequels. Not a fan of Revenge of the Sith. We are fans of Star Wars, just like you. And that's why we do stuff like this. So, as we say at the end of all of our recordings, please, be our friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You, you know what to do. Subscribe up. And that, that, that could be to the podcast. That could be to you, uh, YouTube. That could be just to the site itself. We're here for you. StarWarsTime.net. It's easy. You can even type it in. StarWarsTime.net. Net. You can get everything you need to know, at least the important stuff, right there. All right. Getting nervous, but we're we're rounding home on Star Wars Resistance Season 1. It's been pretty epic so far. I like where it's going. I love that we're getting another season. Can't wait to see where these characters end up. So make sure to stick with us as we recap the last two episodes, maybe one long episode. We'll know tomorrow. But you know our happy asses will be here next week, maybe. That's a lie. Nick might be here next week. Either way, we got your resistance recap coverage needs covered all the time, 24-7, 365, StarWarsTime.net. Beat it into your heads. Oh, if you have other friends that like Star Wars, let them know. Just let them know sometimes Matt has a poopy mouth. (laughs) Like explicit. You know, it's one of those labels. It's on the podcast, so we're covered by that. Sometimes Matt gets a little f f bomb happy, but that's what we do. We're real people, real fans. We're not we're not scripted, unscripted. It's how we live our lives. All right, friends. May the force be with you, always. <laughs>